Hello, I'm Gordon Palmer, minister here at Clement Parish Church, and today we have a service for Sunday the 28th of February. As well as myself in the service, our student placement, George Snedden, will also be taking part reading, doing the scripture reading and, and preaching God's, God's word to us. Hear the word of God, um, <clears throat> verse given to the prophet Hosea. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Let us indeed acknowledge God. Let us indeed come to him and open ourselves to him as we worship him. Bless the Lord, O my soul, is our opening praise. Let us pray, and we will gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer, the form of that prayer that we use, and the words for that will be on the screen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the huge privilege it is that we might bless the Lord. We thank you for a salvation made known to us so that we indeed can come to you, can acknowledge you, can say not just there is a God, not just there is a God who is there, but there is a God who is there, who loves us, who has revealed himself to us, a God who has stooped down and embraced us, a God who even when we had turned our backs and turned away came out seeking us, searching for us. God who did that because he loved us. Not because we were incredibly lovely, not because we made ourselves worthy, not because we had something that you needed, but simply because you chose to love. 
we thank and praise you for being such a God to us and such a God for us. And gracious God, we ask that as we gather our thoughts, our hearts, and our minds before you, that you in that all-loving, caring way will be the one who we acknowledge, the one whose presence we enjoy. We ask forgiveness for the times when we've made light of the ways in which you've sacrificed for us, that you've sought us out. We ask forgiveness for the times we've made out that your love is of no great significance to us or for us. We ask forgiveness for the times when we've seen and heard your call and known it, but have turned away from it, turned our backs on you. Forgiveness for the times when we have thought or imagined that there was something better, something more worthwhile, something more fulfilling elsewhere. Forgive us. Forgive us through your Son, our Lord Jesus, who came among us as one of us, and who came among us serving and caring and finally dying and rising again for us. Might we know now the peace of forgiveness through such a Savior? Might we again know the taste of your love that gives us your mercy, that allows us to know your grace? We ask that in Jesus' name and gather up our prayers and the words he taught his followers. Our Father in heaven. As we go into the second week of Lent, we reach what is literally the starting point and launching pad of Jesus' Galilean ministry. And the events we're going to look at today are full of hope, but they're also full of a declarations of things to come, announcements of what's going to happen next, the manifesto of Christ's mission. So if you want to turn with me to Luke chapter 4, and we'll read from verses 14 to 21. The Word of God. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and rolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Before we begin, let's pray. Father, it is out and out of this world joy that we come to your word. We come to receive our spiritual food that will nurture us and grow us as your people. So this morning, give us your spirit to help us grasp your great truths. Plant them deep within us, water and grow us in faith. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. Probably at this time in our history, more than any other time, perhaps since the Second World War, 
The whole nation has patiently waited on updates from the government each day. I remember last March being focused in front of the television at my parents' house, waiting for the Prime Minister to announce a national lockdown. And I know just this week past, many of us have been patiently waiting in the same way to see what the First Minister would announce as Scotland's route map out of lockdown. The trepidation we get when we are waiting for something to be announced or for someone to say something that impacts us intimately and our lives personally. And I really say that because in our reading today, that would have been the same feeling and the same trepidation and the same insight that the hearts of many of those men and women who sat in the congregation of that synagogue who came to hear Jesus that day would have been feeling. Last week, we heard how Jesus had been tempted for 40 days and 40 nights in the desert and how the Holy Spirit guided him and was his fortress of resistance. And so now Jesus has passed through those deep waters and has now come to the hill country of Galilee and he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we think about Galilee, I want you to imagine in your mind's eye a place of green, fertile land, complete contrast to the desert of temptation that Jesus has just been in. It isn't necessarily hustle and bustle. It's countryside Israel with lots of little villages interspersed throughout the horizon. And for Jesus to be in Galilee alone is a familiar territory because he's first and foremost a Galilean. And this is his comfort zone, or it should be. He's been preaching in the synagogues sometimes, and people are just loving what he's saying. His preaching is attracting some amazing positive reviews. Look at verse 15 when he says he was teaching in the synagogues and everyone praised him. Everyone's praising him. They're loving what he's saying. But of course, what can you expect from people of your extended family, the people who live in the same town as you? This is Jesus' town. He's come to Nazareth. He has relationships with these people. He grew up here. His dad worked here with him. He probably fixed the odd dining table or the odd chair in somebody's house around the corner. And when he comes back, he'll have been welcomed in in a sort of prodigal son kind of way. He's been away for a whole month and more, and now he's back. When I was traveling in Europe a few years ago, I was away for nine weeks, and I came back to a family party celebrations, met with everyone, showed my photos, had a barbecue. Because the return home is always that warm and cosy feeling of seeing people you know again. And people still remember how you were before you experienced all the stuff you did when you were away. So I can kind of get how Jesus must have been feeling. And naturally the time comes where worship is due and he goes to the synagogue and everyone comes because the local boy is preaching. And we can imagine everyone is desperate to hear what he's going to say. What announcement is he going to make? What scripture will he preach on? How long will it be? And so everyone settles down and fixes their eyes on him. Every ear is adjusted, waiting for those first words. I imagine the atmosphere could be cut with a knife. There is whispers at the back. There's a few sweetie papers being unraveled. You could hear a pin drop. And he gets up and reads from the scroll of Isaiah. And once he's read it, he says this. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Eight words. Not only a testimony from Christ himself that sermons don't need to go on forever, but the words were absolute dynamite. You can just envision the thoughts of the people who were listening. She's saying, has he just claimed all those things about himself? He's saying, is he actually saying he's the Messiah that Isaiah's promised? They're also, and is this local joiner guy decided to come back and say he's the hoped for savior of the world? What he just said in relation to himself 
was an amazing claim. Because his identity was critical to his mission. And I think that's the first place we need to stop right now and reflect on. Because what Jesus does, amongst other things in his sermon, the short talk, is to announce who he is. He's asserting that he is the anointed one of God. The chosen one, he's been given a special place and a special mission to save the world from their sins. And I think if we don't get that identity right in our minds today, then the rest of what I'm about to say is pointless. Because without Jesus being who he says he is, the actions he describes from Isaiah are pointless. They hold no value. They will change nobody. They will never come to any fruition. And I say that because we are changed ourselves and our communities are changed. Our cities and towns and streets are changed, not simply by the things we seek to do, but by when we see Jesus for who he really is and can testify to that. When we can show people we are captivated by him and live under him as our Lord and as our Saviour. Jesus has come, he says, to fix the four biggest problems in our society. The biggest issues caused by sin, poverty, captivity, blindness, and oppression. And that's what we see in the quote from Isaiah in verses 18 and 19. And what we have in this statement from Jesus is his mission to the world. And if this is his mission to the world, if this is his manifesto for how his church should be, then as the members of his body, now the buck stops with us. We are his hands and his feet in the world. This prophecy and its fulfillment is filled, fulfilled in Christ's coming and it is manifested in the church. Just as our bodies are what people see of us, the church is what people see of Jesus. And just as our bodies are put into visible action, so Christ is put into visible action through the church. This is our mission as well. But let me declare to you unashamedly that the most loving thing that we can do for anyone is to release them from the spiritual aspects of Isaiah's words from the captivity of sin, from the blindness of unbelief, from the oppression of the devil. Any effort at social improvement or social justice that seeks to neglect the goal to share the, the gospel and save the soul becomes merely just actions and works. Because it's entirely true that when a person becomes a follower of Jesus, it changes them. But it's also true that the way people see the greatness of Christ is in us by doing the practical things he teaches us to do. This is how we shine a light in the darkness. This is how we become the salt and the light of the earth. So I want to go through these four principles of the Christian manifesto that Jesus lays out at the start of his ministry here. I got a letter in the mail the other day from the local COVID support group. Now, I know that poverty is actually right on my doorstep. I live in a priority area. But I was making my breakfast at the time, two rolls and bacon, the usual Saturday morning treat. And I was reading this, and this is a direct quote from it. Your local support group would like to know of anyone who is in need of a hot meal or help with any children's packed lunches, or putting a few extra things in the kitchen cupboard where needed. Please pass on any names and let us know how we can help. Really? I remember the first sermon I ever wrote was in Galatians 2, and Paul and Barnabas are heading out to preach to the Gentiles, and they go to the apostles. And what's interesting is what they tell them. They say, We'll give you the right hand of fellowship that we go to the Gentiles that you preach to them and bring the gospel to them. But remember the poor. 
And Paul says, it was the very thing I was eager to do. Remember the poor. Right at the very beginning of the church, when Christ was walking this earth, all through the years, the entire mission was to be called to be mindful and care for the poor. Because, brothers and sisters, they are of incredible importance to God. And the church has to have responsibility over them. And if there's any time like now with COVID and the aftermath, we must remember to never forget the poor. Those in and outside of our churches who are laid off or furloughed, the ones who are currently in financial need, the ones on the street in Glasgow tonight that will go freezing and hungry. We cannot allow ourselves to shut down, shut down the issue due to the size of the problem. We can't retreat to Netflix while they perish anymore. It's, it's really heavy on my heart as it will be on yours and it demands serious prayer. And our act of service is to pray first, to share Jesus with the poor, but help where we can. Challenge ourselves to go the extra mile when we are called to walk the extra mile. But poverty is not just about material wealth. We are all impoverished by sin. So we need to turn our attention to how poverty works, that poverty works in our own lives. Because that puts us on an equal footing with the material poor. Because serving the poor is an opportunity to worship. Serving the poor is serving Jesus. We'll sing about that today. So as Christians, we are to look around and see where we can worship. Isaiah also says, I have called you by your name and you are mine. The poor are real people. They have a name, a potential, a future. And we are called by Jesus and his ministry to go after their release. And that leads me to captivity, imprisonment, whatever word you want to use, because sin also has this really interesting way of imprisoning people with vice. Sex, alcohol, drugs, gluttony. It ought to hurt our hearts that the people made in the image of God are finding themselves captured by these things. Let me tell you, I have a first-hand experience I would share with you today. I have a cousin right now who is seriously addicted to drugs, horrible drugs, and we've been praying hard for him, and my aunt and her family have rallied around him and taken him in. They've paid his drug debt, they've gave him money for drugs so he can shoot up in the house safely. They've tried everything to keep him safe. And I know that it's broken their heart to see him like this. He's handsome, he's bright, he's young, he's got potential, he's loving, he's got two kids. And he was my friend for most of my childhood and now he's torn and squandered his life on drugs. But let me tell you, I had a chat with him a few months ago and he says to me, George, I don't have any more hope left. God is now my only hope. And in a few months, he's going to go away and dry out with a Christian church organisation who will work with him and lead him in a life of prayer and repentance and recovery. Because God is his last hope, folks. That's what he said to me. And it was in that same time, that same con context, that I noticed how spiritually blind we can all be. When someone needs someone else to show them enough love to open their eyes, it's no longer okay to affirm everything. Sometimes we need to be truthful and honest with someone in order to see them change. That's what Jesus would have done. You see, Christians all come at blindness from the same place. That's why the ground is even at the foot of the cross. All of us have been, as the hymn says, once blind, 
but now sees. And our blindness is linked to our deadness. It's, it's the role of the disciple of Jesus to open that space up and reveal God's glory and light up the darkness. It's why I said right at the start of this sermon that we need to be able to see Jesus clearly enough because it can't be the blind leading the blind. If we have Jesus and we have his gift to mission, to outreach, to lead, to show people to be the salt and light, then we have to know him personally ourselves. And so let me end on the oppressed. There are people in this world right now who have lost their voice, who don't get a chance to get their story told. I'm thinking right now about the Ethiopian genocide probably none of us have really heard about, or the insurmountable deaths in Yemen, other places I'm sure we have not even heard of. I'm thinking about the abuse suffered by men and women behind closed doors, violence and control. I see it in children and infants who lose their lives. I see babies who are struggling. I've seen kids who go to school and don't have a lunch. I see the disabled and the infirm rejected and isolated. Sometimes our greatest gift, aside the gospel for the oppressed, is to give them a voice. That's what Jesus did. The Bible is strewn with examples of where oppressed people have been given light and been given a voice. Remember the bleeding women living on the fringes of society in the middle of a crowd of wealthy men. Jesus turns and finds her and speaks to her directly. Or the Samaritan women or the poor man at the gate or the widow, Jesus gave them all a voice. So we are called as Christians in service to put on a habit of service and speak for the oppressed. To hold to account those who oppress and to make ways of freedom where we can. And now let me take you back to that congregation in Jesus' time. Sitting with their mouths open after Jesus had just spoken. This was the big thing he was going to say. A big manifesto to say what had been fulfilled. It was fulfilled in him. And of course... There's so much more about Christ's first sermon that we could say. But I hope today that we've seen that Christ's manifesto for the church is to help fix sin through what has been fulfilled in him. Just like him, each one of us Christians have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus died for us and he lives in us and we are called as his disciples to share this with others. We are to pray and to seek for the release of captives to shine a light into the dark recesses of our own lives and the lives of others, to speak up for those who don't have a voice as long as it takes for the Lord to return. And we're to do this with a sure certainty at the back of our minds. It is a certainty of the gospel, and it is that we all have our eyes fixed on the day of the Lord's favour. Because when that day comes, it will be a day of vengeance and of reward. The tables will be turned. The narrow, rocky road full of poverty and oppression and vices and all the sinful ills of the world will open into an endless field of thick green grass and crystal streams and cool winds and warm sunshine. It will be full of precious friends and perfect health with no weeping or hurting. And we will spend an eternity in the presence of Jesus. And so this affliction we feel deep inside of us in our world right now will give way to an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And brothers and sisters, this is something, this is something in the darkest of times that no politician, no doctor, no expert, no friend can ever promise you. It can only be promised and fulfilled in Christ himself. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us Jesus. Once again, we read of his work in the world, his manifesto for ministry, his way that he's sought people out and found them, released the captives, give voice to the poor, set people free, raised them up and given them hope. And Lord, we ask that you give us that message this morning anew, that we might seek you out, seek you out for where you are and take you to people who need you most. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to say the Apostles' Creed in a few moments, but before we do, let's continue our worship in our next hymn, All I Once Held Thee. Let's join together in prayer. We'll pray for ourselves, for the world around us, for being the body of Christ, for Jesus' mission in the world. Let's talk to God. Let's pray. We think back to that passage that George read. Think back how the people had gathered to hear Jesus. Lord, it speaks to us of the importance of worship together. Yet it speaks to us of an experience that's been all too rare for us in the past year.
And Lord, we sometimes we know we don't miss something until we've not got it. And might this period, while it's had some pluses for us, might it be a reminder to us of the worth, the significance of joining together with one another in praise and in prayers. Might it speak to us of the importance of your people gathering and gathering with an expectancy to hear you speak, just as the folks of Galilee did that day as they gathered to hear Jesus. And Lord, give us too uh, wisdom as we explore possibilities about meeting again. And as we do so with different experiences, different hopes, different reservations, different anxieties, give us a, a wisdom through the opportunities, the pathways that are before us that we might keep safe, that we might do what's right and best for one another, but that we might seize the opportunities to lift up the name of Jesus. We remember, too, that in this past year, there's been many another time when folks had wanted to gather, folks who've been frustrated by small turnouts and attendances at funerals, because that's all that was allowed it, allowed. People who have had much smaller or even no weddings. People who have missed graduations and celebrations, not celebrated birthdays and anniversaries, festivals, and so on. And Lord, we pray for those still hurting through missing out, those who are still sore at what was taken from them, what they couldn't have and couldn't enjoy that had been so much part of life or so much what they had been looking forward to. And we pray too for those who have suffered in a quite direct way economically through these things, through these events being cancelled, through hospitality not being possible and so on. And remembering all that George said about those who are oppressed, those who are poor, those who are put down. Might we look out for opportunities to notice those still carrying the hurts of missing out in this recent time? And might we do what and how we can to help? Lord, the crowd that gathered to hear Jesus that day heard him read from the Scriptures. And we thank you for having the Bible. We thank you for those who did so much to translate it, those who have done so much to print copies that we could have at affordable prices those who have written booklets and devotional materials that guide us and, and help us better into understanding and, and reading more regularly. We give you thanks for those who have done that. Maybe some who have done it just because it was their job. But Lord, others have done it even paying with their own lives. And we pray that we'll not take your word for granted, not take the availability of your word for granted, and that we might make most of the opportunities to read and to share and talk about your word. We pray for those who are still working to put the Scriptures into the hands of others, those who are still working translating the Bible into languages that are barely written down at all, we thank you for pioneering groups like the Wycliffe Bible Translators, and we pray for them. We pray for Martin Robb working with Wycliffe in Hungary, and for Martin and for all those connected with that work of trying to make Scripture available to folks 
We ask that you'll give them energy and strength for the task, and we pray that they'll continue to be able to overcome the existing obstacles that the pandemic has put in their way. Lord, we heard about Jesus' declaration that that message was good news for the poor. Lord, in the past year, there have been lots of instances of folks doing without, folks losing their jobs. And Lord, there's been quite a few instances too of many of us being better off. We've had the same income, but not the same expenditures. We have become more unequal as a people, more unequal as a, a community and as a society. And Lord, we pray that you'll keep us from, rescue us from that attitude that says, what about me, what about me, what about me, and seeks to grab, seeks to take advantage, seeks to get a place further up the queue. Rather, help us to be a people on the lookout for those who have been put down, those who have gone through serious hardship. And help us to work towards not back to a normal life, but back to a more just, a more compassionate, a more loving society. Your word, too, was good news for those who were in captivity. And George mentioned places like Yemen, where there is still huge impoverishment and keeping down. And we think, too, of other places in our world. We think of the situation in, in Russia, the, where any opposition to Putin just seems to become put down in a hard and in an oppressive way. In Myanmar, where the military have once more oppressively and cruelly taken control. In these places, in other places, Lord, where the yearning and the long for freedom and for justice is being treated with military force and, and police might. We, we pray for breakthroughs. We pray for justice. Lord, that word that Jesus spoke, spoke too about healing. And we pray for those who have been and who continue to be at the front line of caring for those who are in need, for those who are badly overstretched and tired by the huge burden of providing health care in, in these times. Lord, help us to watch out again and to care. But also we, we pray for wi wisdom and good sense to prevail that there might be a decrease in the instances of transmission, that there might soon be breathing space, there might soon be some release for those who are so badly overstretched. And Lord, we thank you and pray about the reminder that George gave us that the church today is the body of Christ, the agents for Jesus in the world, Christ's ambassadors. And so we pray that you, through your Holy Spirit, will help your church to live up to so wonderful a calling and to do so in a spirit of service and humility, just as Jesus served us in that way. Help us, Lord, to declare without fear or favor the coming day of the Lord, a day of both judgment and salvation, but yet to declare that with love, to proclaim Christ and not our own ideas or our own preferences, to proclaim Christ and not ourselves as nice or worthy people. Rather, in these times that call for wisdom, Give us that and also with that a fearless faithfulness that we might remain loyal to Jesus and fruitful in his service. 
and Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may all the glory be yours. Amen. Just before we sing our closing hymn, so one notice to, to bring, and that's to announce many folks I know will have heard, but to announce the death of one of our members, Pat Harrow. Pat had been in Lindsayfield Lodge for the past six years or so and previously stayed in Collinsey. And to say that Pat's funeral will be at two o'clock on Tuesday, the 9th of March at South Lanarkshire Crematorium. Of course, it's done again with all the restrictions of the pandemic, but the funeral cortege will come and go around the car park here at Claremont before going on to South Lanarkshire. And if anyone wants to pay their respects at that way and at that, that time, then the cortege will be at the Claremont car park around about 20 to 2, uh, around about 1.40 on Tuesday, the 9th of March. And we commend all of Pat's family to your thoughts and prayers at this time. A hymn that does speak very much about that following Jesus, about care, about serving, about touching, about humbling, about making contact. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? And after the hymn, we'll join together in the words of the blessing of the grace. God bless. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the love of God.